Dear friends and family in Christ, may God's rich grace, mercy, and peace be with you this day and each and every one of your days. Amen. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for sending your Son, Christ Jesus, to be our Savior. We thank you that he has conquered sin, death, and the grave, and that we now live as your children, set free to be your people living in this world. Lord, we pray that you would guide each of our footsteps, that you would lead us each of our days by your Holy Spirit, that our lives might truly honor you, that the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts may be truly pleasing in your sight. All things we pray in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. If anyone was to ask you what your favorite Bible verse is, what immediately comes to your mind? I imagine some of you it might be John 3, 16. Some of you might be Psalm chapter 23, the whole thing, or Psalm chapter 121. Some of you, maybe it's Romans 3.23 or 8.28, maybe even Ephesians 2.8 and 9. How about Matthew chapter 7, verse 1? Anybody? Does anybody have that as their confirmation verse? Well, even though you may not know it by heart, a lot of people sure do. Judge not that you be not judged. Or if you learned it as I did in the King James, judge not lest ye be judged. I hear this verse all the time. I hear it from good Christian people. I hear it from people who have never stepped into a church, but they sure know that verse. I hear it from people who haven't been to church in quite a while, and they'll say, judge not lest ye be judged. And I hear it all over the place. And can you blame them? I mean, truly. Who really likes to talk about sin? Let me rephrase that. Who likes to talk about their own sin? Let me give you an example. If, you were, if I was to invite any one of you to come up here, how many of you would like to stand up here and confess before all of us the sins that you committed this week? How about yesterday? The last three minutes? Any takers? I, I, I didn't think so. No, we, we really don't like to talk about our own sin, do we? Well, and really we don't like to talk about sin at least not in front of church. We save that for the bathroom after church, or we save that for the ride home from church, or, or during the week sometime where we talk about other people's sins, but, but certainly not in front of church. Although Chaplain Smith, the former chaplain at the Naval Air Facility El Centro, he told me about one church that made everyone's sin very public. They, his roommate, when he was in college, at then seminary, he had a, at his church, they had what was called the sinner's list. Now, he didn't describe it, but I always pictured that must be a big bulletin board on the back of their church. And he told us about it because of the fact that his roommate's mom made it onto the sinner's list. And the sinner's list meant that no one in the congregation, not even her son who was at seminary, could talk to her. She was to be shunned by the congregation. They liked talking about sin. And until she stood before everyone, confessing her sin, repenting to them, she was to be shunned. I often wondered what it was that got her on that list. But over time, I decided that wasn't that important. And I thought about it for a little bit more, or longer, and I realized that, well, we actually do have a sinner's list as well. We call ours a membership roster. And while I jest a little bit there, isn't it true that we all are on the sinner's list? We don't have a big bulletin board in the back of our church. But we certainly know our names are there. I don't think as Christians it takes much to convince you all that you are sinners. We know the verses that Paul said today by heart, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I wonder if for us we like to have degrees, to talk about sin as if there are various levels of sin. And as you think about that, I'd like you to think about that in light of our, the last verse of our gospel for this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Jesus himself said, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How about this one? Is this your favorite verse? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, that verse is not one that we typically memorize as our favorite. That verse is one that we usually prefer would be just for those Old Testament folk. You know, the Jewish people who 
had God living in a tabernacle and, uh, and later in the temple who was right there among them. They were people of the covenant. We like to pass that verse off as Jesus' word was only reserved for them. Now, I don't know if any of you would do that. But there are groups of people in Christianity who say that Jesus' words in the gospel, that they were only directed towards those Old Testament people. They aren't directed towards us today. We're good people. We live in the gospel. We're all set. Well, if we go back to Matthew 5, verse 1, we realize who Jesus' audience is. Jesus wasn't just talking to the Pharisees. He wasn't just talking to the Sadducees. He was talking to crowds and his disciples. As followers of God today, we are his disciples. His words are for us. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now perhaps we missed something in translation here. Maybe when Jesus says perfect there, maybe, maybe he means that it's an ongoing process, that eventually we're going to get to perfection, but we're just not there yet. That sanctification and justification are works that God's doing in our lives that eventually we're going to be all set. Well, let me stop for a minute and remind you what justification and sanctification mean. Justification is a legal term. It's a word that was used throughout the New Testament, but it's one that means literally to be made righteous, to be made just. It's a word that, is, uh, that, uh, that when we use that word in, with theology, means that we are made right before God. In other words, we are sinless before God. Sanctification, on the other hand, Sanctification refers to that idea that we have been made holy. The root word is holy. And we've been set apart, literally set apart from the world. So when we read that those words justification and sanctification in Scripture, we see that first of all justification happened on the cross. We were justified by the blood of Christ. As Jim was reading this morning, he used that big word propitiation. And that's another word we hear, but that word means that we've been made right before God. It's a done deal. Now, sanctification is a done deal. It happened in our baptism. We believe and we teach that in baptism, we were set apart. We were made holy. God laid his claim upon our hearts. And so whether you are baptized at the age of two months or two days or baptized at the age of 97 years old, that the Lord is claiming you as his own. It is the work of God. So it's not an ongoing process. And just imagine for a minute if it was an ongoing process. Just imagine for a minute if justification and sanctification were works that were ongoing in our lives that we were doing. We would constantly be living in a state of not sure what our status before God was. We would constantly be wondering, am I good enough? Am I righteous enough? Am I holy enough? And what would the answer be? Nope. Uh Uh-uh. No way. Not a chance. It's not a process, folks. We are justified and we are sanctified, not by our own doing or our own works, but by the work of God through his Holy Spirit in our baptism when he called us his own. And it's so important that we understand this because this helps us to understand when we look at sin what that means for us, what it means when Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, that it is the work of God for us. Now, God, he has a pretty simple standard. When it comes to sin, he doesn't have degrees of good or bad. Some sins are worse than other sins. For God, you're either a sinner or you're sinless. You're either just or you're unjust. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. It's pretty simple for God. But we, in our human wisdom, we come up with all these ideas of what we think sin should be. We define sin as if that some are worse than other sins. And so this gives us a place to comfortably judge others. We call some sins mortal sins or venial sins. And let me talk to you about what those terms mean. You maybe have heard those terms used in Christianity before. Well, those terms are particularly Roman Catholic terms. And mortal sins, according to the Roman Catholic Catechism, are sins that destroy the charity of man's heart towards God. Venial sins are sins that destroy or that, that wound or harm the charity of man's heart towards God. Now, before we go any further, let me explain those terms to you. Now, those are not our Lutheran terms, but I want you to know those terms because you'll hear those. Now, mortal sins, and according to Roman Catholicism, are willful sins, sins that are chosen to be done against God. 
These are sins such as murder, adultery, choosing to lie to someone else. These are sins, if they go unrepentant, lead directly to hell. Now that other term, venial sins, remember I said that's the sins that, that wound the charity towards God. Well, let me explain to you what those are. I'll give you a couple examples. Those would be slander or gossip or, or things that maybe that we don't willfully do but do happen in our lives. Those sins, if they go unrepented, not confessed before God. Well, those sins then are sins that do still separate us. But now they've answered that question. They've, they've set up what they call purgatory. Now, this isn't our Lutheran belief, but this is one that they hold to. And purgatory is this idea that after death, that there's this way to, the, to purify ourselves. And let me share with you the, the, uh, just a little piece from their, their, their catechism here. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Well, hopefully you all are maybe a little quizzical about that after death purification when we look at matthew chapter 25 jesus says so clearly that after death two, one of two things happens either the sheep join him in eternity for eternal life or the goats join him in or join the devil and his demons in eternal death there's not a center road there's one or the other and while that may be a, a an idea that seems to be attractive because it gives a second chance a, another way out it's not one that we can find at least as we look at god's word but we do this all the time, whether or not we call them mortal or venial sins. We certainly treat sins as if they have different weights in our lives, in our worlds. If I was to ask you which is more evil, a murderer or a liar, what would your answer be? How about someone who steals from uh, uh, an elderly person, a senior citizen, or someone who gossips? Who would be more evil? We certainly have our opinions, don't we? Our subjective opinions of, of what sin's weight should be. We live in this world where we call one thing bad and another thing, well, oh, okay, it's okay, it's not so bad because, well, maybe I sometimes do that as a, as a Christian myself. But God's Word says that His, His standard's simple. It's simple. It's either you're a sinner or you're not. And that's not an easy thing to think about, is it? It's not an easy thing to think about because then all of a sudden, when we look at sin, we realize that, well, someone who has an abortion, well, they're no different than we are. Someone who lives a lifestyle that we may not condone or agree with, they're no different than you are, than I am. It's not easy to think about, though, because it makes us reflect on the fact that we are all in the same boat. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Paul, he really unpacks this in the first chapter, or in Ephesians chapter 2, in the first verses. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out our desi the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sins. We walked in the ways of disobedience. And I love, don't forget that last word, like the rest of humankind. Like the rest of humankind. We are imperfect. And whether or not it's easy to look at our sinfulness that way, it is important that we do. Because then it helps us to see what grace is. When we look at sin and we realize it is that which kills us and separates us from God, we realize it is not a process that we can move towards God, that we can choose Him or accept Him, but it is Him choosing us, Him accepting us, Him choosing us while we were yet sinners, and Him freely giving us His forgiveness. That is what grace give, is. His free gift of forgiveness for you and for me while we are yet sinners. While we were yet dead in our trespasses, the Spirit came into our hearts, creating faith, breathing into us life, eternal life, and the promise of salvation. And that is what grace is. Grace is God's rich gifts of forgiveness, not for what we have done, but what Christ has done. And it was given to us in our baptisms. In Romans chapter 6, 
Paul does a nice job of connecting our baptism to this promise of grace. Do you not, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. God gave us the gift of forgiveness in our cleansed hearts. He sanctified us and set us apart. He made us holy and gave us the promise of eternal life. Long before we could remember, long before we could claim it, He claimed us, putting His name upon our hearts. And when we realize this, we realize that we are not in a place to judge because it is strictly God's free gift to us. We realize we are not in a place to condescend or lord ourselves over others. So what about someone caught in sin? Does this mean that we should ignore them? Let them figure it out for themselves? Well, to borrow a quote from Paul, by no means but it does mean that we are to help them. It means that we are to go to them. Not to condescend to them, but to show them God's Word. Because God's Word is truth. God's Word shows us what God views as right and what God views as wrong. It is not our place to judge, but it is God's place. For God is the one who judges the heart. God is the one who knows the mind. Judge not lest ye be judged, but God's Word does judge. God's Word does tell us that some sins are wrong, that all sins are wrong and that sorry those sins that are wrong must be confessed to him god's word tells us that we as the people of god are no better than they are but that we can show them the truth in his word and show them his forgiveness and the spirit will work the spirit will work despite us it is not our job to judge but it's the work of the spirit to convict the heart to lead them to the cross and to lead them to repentance. Just like the Spirit led us to the cross where we confess our sins and God who is faithful and just forgives our sins. And at the cross, our sins are forgiven. At the empty tomb, we, realize, we know that our Lord conquered sin, death, and the devil, that we shall rise. This is the promised message. And so when you think about sin, know that your sins are forgiven. Not by what you have done or by what you have said, but by what Christ has done. That you are made perfect by Jesus' blood alone. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh, gracious Lord, we do confess all of our sins to you, knowing that you forgive our sins and cleanse us from our sinfulness, making us whole and making us holy. Lead us always by your holy word, that we might follow your paths, that we might witness to you, that others too may know the truth, that they may know the truth of your word. Lord, forgive us for those times when we have been judgmental, when we have not seen ourselves as poor, miserable sinners that we are. Forgive us for those times when we have condescended over others and, and judged them. Instead, let us show them the truth of God's word. Let us love them as you have first loved us. Let us come to them with humility, knowing that our sins were great, but you have forgiven them, and that there is no sin that is too great for you to forgive. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.